Well, welcome to Grace Bible Church, and for those of you that are online, we want to welcome you this morning. And if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. And uh, the verses that we're going to be studying this morning are verses 13 through 15. We've even titled the message this morning, Limiting Freedom with Love. Now, in this section of Scripture, Paul the Apostle, he gives us a really a wonderful example of obeying God for the right reason. But now you'll recall also that some false teachers known as Judaizers were teaching the Galatians that for the Galatians to be saved, for them to receive salvation, these people, and let me stop this for a moment before I go on, this kind of false teaching, it's still being taught today, isn't it? It's a teaching of false doctrine. But to go back now, that, that not only these Galatians, but people today, for salvation, to be saved, you have to obey all kinds of rules. What kind of rules? Well, the mosaic rules, the ceremonial rules, and even man-made rules. In so many words, the people of Galatia had to do. And in so many words, people of today have to do. Have to do what? They had to do works for their salvation. And throughout our whole time in Galatians, Paul is teaching biblically that you don't work for your salvation. It is the gift of God. Amen? By faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And Paul's teaching, he's teaching this because really Jesus taught it. The reason why we as believers obey the Word of God is you know why we obey the Word of God? I'll tell you. It's to express our gratitude and our thankfulness to God for salvation received through... You ready for this? Sola gratia. What's that? Salvation is a gift from God through, through grace, not as a result of human works. It's grace. Sola fide. Salvation is faith in, found in faith in Christ Jesus alone. Sola Christos. Salvation is found in Jesus Christ in Him alone and no other. No one can give you salvation. You can't earn salvation, beloved. It is through Jesus Christ in Him alone. Sola Scriptura. The Bible is the sole authority for Christians in both faith, doctrine, and practice. That was the whole thing with the Protestant Reformation. Who was the head of the church? And the answer is, God is the head of the church. Not some man. And then the last sola, the solo Deo Gloria. Think of this whether it's the people of Galatia or you or I. Salvation is a work of God for His glory. That's what salvation is. And that's what Paul was teaching. And Paul taught that because Jesus taught that. Paul taught it, the, the other apostles taught it, and the, and the church taught it all the way down to today, and we need to be teaching it. Salvation is only through Jesus Christ and Him alone, and there is no other. Now this morning, we're going to be looking at three points in, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13, 14, and 15. The first one is this. A restatement of your freedom. You remember back in verse 13, or in verse 13 now, Paul says, For you were called to freedom. Right? Right. This is a restatement of Galatia chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1a, where Paul said, It was for freedom that Christ set you free, or set us free. 
Beloved, these words declare that all of us who have received Christ by faith are free. We have been set from free. We have been set free. Think of this. From the penalty of sin. You have been set free from the power of Satan who was once your master. You have been set free. You ready for this one? From the wrath of God. Because the wrath of God is coming, folks. Amen? It's coming. Whether people want to admit it or not, it's coming. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are set free from that wrath of God. And then here's the other the last freedom you're, you have. You are set free from an accusing conscience. Have you ever laid in bed when the light flip goes off? And you thought about stupid stuff that you did before you were a Christian in your BC days. And even some of the stupid things you've done after that would be labeled sin. And your mind starts playing games with you. Well, it's not really your mind, it's Satan using your mind to play game with you. And he whispers in your ear, Well, if you were truly saved, you wouldn't have said that. You wouldn't have thought that. You wouldn't have done that. Are you really a Christian? And then he pulls back and he lets our minds run wild. And we start thinking, well, am I? Because if I was a Christian, I wouldn't have said that. I wouldn't have had that thought. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have acted like that. We're set free from that. If you have truly accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are set free from that. Tell Satan, first of all, to bug off and tell your mind to settle down and go to sleep. Amen? Now, we are free to serve the Lord and become like His Son, are we not? Now, here's a question for you, but as always, I'm going to give you the answer. Don't you wish I was your high school teacher? Because they didn't. Well, they did in a roundabout way, but you had to listen. Are you free, and, and, and don't, don't rush ahead of me, are you free to disobey God and become self-centered? Are you free to sin as an expression, now here's where it comes in, as an expression of your new life in Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. You're not free to do that. In fact, that idea that, well, I'm a Christian now, I can do whatever I want because I'm free of sin's penalty. That's stupid, to use a good, deep theological term. Or I'll tack something onto it. That's just foolishness. And here's why it's stupid, and here's why it's foolishness. Because it supposes that evil can be good and wrong can be right. And that's just dumb. Here's another deep theological term. Dumb. And we have a lot of that going on today, don't we? Where people are calling good evil and evil good. People are calling right wrong and wrong right. That's just foolishness, folks. That kind of pho phony freedom actually enslaves rather than liberates. It shackles us to our sinful pride that says, I want my way and I won't let anyone or anything stop me from getting what I want. There's even a song that was made famous. It was written by a singer back in the day. His name was Paul Anka, if you go back as far as I do. And it was made famous really by a guy that they called Old Blue Eyes, Frank Sinatra. And the title of the song was My Way. And it's a, I, you have to be honest, when, if you listen to it, it's a catchy little tune. Because that's what happens. They, they put words to catchy little tunes. So it goes into your brain and it stays there. But in that song, My Way, it talks about a person, listen to this, it talks about a person who has done everything their way. Their way without regard for anyone else and including disregard for God. 
They did it their way. And you know what the sad thing is? I have conducted funerals. And that person is laid out in that coffin. And like at most funerals, they pick three songs. Okay? And I remember the first time I was literally blown away. It was a guy's death. I don't remember who he was, but I remember it was a guy and his wife came up and she goes, I picked three songs and this is the second one. The first one, I think, was like Amazing Grace, which I said, okay, that's cool. Second song, she goes, this was basically how he lived his life and it was my way. And I thought, well, dude, your way just took you to hell because it wasn't Jesus' way. Secondly, it's limitations on our freedom. We'll see that in verse 13, the latter part of verse 13 all the way to 15. But beloved, true Christian freedom involves restraints, doesn't it? And these restraints that help not hinder our spiritual growth in service. Okay? So let's break down verses 13, 14, and 15. Number one. We are not free to indulge in sinful nature. Paul says in verse 13, the last part, Brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. He's saying don't do that. Our flesh is sinful, is it not? And Paul is saying don't do that. We must not allow our sinful nature to use our newfound freedom in Christ as a base of operation. Well, I can do whatever I want. I'm saved. That's a lie from the pits of hell. You know and I know it. Beloved, listen. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your sinful nature was nailed to the cross when Jesus died to pay for your sins and mine. Now, we're, we're going to see it later on, but I'll just read the verse right now. Verse 24 Paul writes, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. And because of that fact, beloved, we must leave it on the cross. Amen? And let it die. And don't try to remove the nails and allow it to control you again. So the question is this. You ready? Who controls your life? Is it Jesus? Or your sinful natures? Are you bowing before Jesus? Or are you bowing before self? And the Scriptures tells me that you can't serve both. Beloved, we will find real freedom only through obeying the word, of law, the word of the Lord and yielding to the Spirit's control in our lives. Then and only then do we have real freedom. And why do we obey the Word of God? Paul said so. Because we are showing gratitude to God that He saved us. There's an old saying that goes, Christian freedom is freedom from sin not freedom to sin. A lot of times I don't like old sayings, but I like this old saying. Number two, we are not free to exploit others. Using people to get what we want is an act of the flesh. Because think of it, before Jesus Christ came into your life, who was the big three in your life? Me, myself, and I. Right? And everything I did to the most innocent of the little thing was for me, myself, and I. That someone would look at me and go, man, that was so nice of you. That was so kind of you. That You're just a sweetheart of a guy. Well, thank you. Even that was for myself. Because I wanted to act humble. If you've got to act humble, you're not. 
It's not by faith, beloved. When we treat other people like things, we run the risk of not only hurting other people, but we hurt ourselves. And worse than that, we hurt the Lord. And worse than that, we hurt our testimony that we're a Christian. That's what Paul means in verse 15 when he says, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Christian freedom urges us to go a different route, does it not? It exhorts us to serve one another in what? Paul says, in love. Listen, Jesus served us in love. He didn't have to die on that cross. He didn't die there for His sins because He had none. He died on that cross for your raunchy sins and my raunchy sins. And I know Ranchi's deep. But that's what he did. And he did it. Why? Because he loved us. He didn't have to. He wanted to. And aren't you glad he did? Now this fact is seen in verse 13, the, the, the third part. But through love serve one another, Paul writes. Now, beloved, listen when I say about love one another, this isn't wishy-washy love, you know, where it's so sugary it makes you sick. It's not that kind of love that's based on feeling. Nor is it the sort of love that says, well, I'll meet you halfway. That's a lie. I've done weddings and I've looked at young guys and young gals in front of me and I said, listen, I, if you have this mentality right here, right now, that you think, well, I'll meet you halfway. I said, you're going to be before a divorce court. I said, because either he or she is not going to measure up. I said, one of you is going to end up cheating on the other one. I said, it's not a halfway proposition. It's not a contract. You do this, I'll do this. You don't do that, I won't do that. I go, no. I said, it's a covenant. Before Almighty God. I said, let's just save yourself some money right here, right now. If you're not ready to love her, to love Him, whether they show it back or say it back or not, I go, let's just close this off right now. Don't put a lot of money into the invitations. Don't buy the wedding dress. Don't get the tux. And just... Shake hands and say, see you later, pal. It's not a contract. Like some company. The love that Paul speaks about is love like Jesus showed when He took our punishment upon Him. This kind of love is agape love. It's a sacrificial love, is it not? It is a love with that that you give and you give and you give and I'm going to repeat myself on that and you receive nothing in return. Now let me ask you this. Do you have that kind of love? Do you have that kind of love for people? Not your spouse, not your kiddos, not even your grandkiddos. Do you have that kind of love for other people? You know, do you love those kind of people that can't, that just, they're just not lovable, but you love them anyway. Do you reach out to those around you who cannot pay back your kindness? True Christian freedom, freedom treats people as a person to be served and loved and never as a thing to be used or abused. Number three, we're not free to disregard the needs of others. We'll see this in, in verse 14 in a moment. Back, I believe, oh, I may be wrong on my dates, but bear with me. Probably in the mid to late 60s to somewhere in the 70s, there was this philosophy that said, live and let live. Remember that? Some of you may have heard it on the radio. Beloved, that philosophy of live and let live is born to Christian view of freedom. We are our brother's keepers. Amen? We are called to use our freedom to love others. 
to care for them, to meet them if they need meeting. If they need care, we care for them. And Paul puts it this way in verse 14. He says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, love your, uh, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know anybody that hates themselves. Unless they're just totally deranged or demonic oppressed or opet, uh, are possessed. The question is, do you care for the needs of others as much as you care for your own needs? Are you willing to give up some comfort in order to make the life of someone else just a little bit better? Christian freedom was given to us to share liberally, not to possess greedily. Aren't you glad that somebody loved you enough to tell you about Jesus Christ? I am. Thank God, and I'll just name his name. Thank God for Dave McMurtry. I know none of you guys, you've heard me talk about him, but you didn't know him personally. But thank God that he cared enough for me. That he shared Christ with me. And thank God for the men throughout my life that gave up their time for me to help me grow in the Lord. And when you need to be thanking God for men and women that have come into your life that could have been doing something else. But they said, I'm going to go help. And they named your name. We need to be doing the same thing, right? Number three, in our points, and our outlines, guidance for our balance. Now, let me say this. Now, realizing that genuine freedom comes with certain limits is important, right? We have to understand that. But by itself, this knowledge isn't enough. We need to know when we should restrain and allow to allow the exercise of our freedom. Beloved, there are times when we, uh, to use it in simple terms, there are times when we must learn to apply the brakes to the full exercise of our freedom. We're not, I'm not saying that you allow somebody just to go out stupidly sin. No. But there's times we need to know and we, we need to put on the brakes of that restraint and that freedom. Romans chapter 14 gives us some guidelines I, I think that will help us make those decisions. Now before we turn there, or you can be turned there and I will here in a second, let me just lay the ground rule here, work here. This chapter, Romans chapter 14, historically, the historical context involves meat eating from pagan sacrifices. Okay? Animals that were sacrificed to, to pagan gods. And back in, in Paul's days, there were people divided over whether it was right to buy and eat this meat or not. So Paul addresses this misunderstanding, this disagreement. And Paul, first of all, he points out, and you ready for this, that nothing in God's creation is evil in itself. I remember there was this guy He was up on the roof. Now the scripture says that he was meditating. I think he was just sleeping in an afternoon warm. Okay? Guy's what name was Peter. And he has this vision. Remember that? In Acts? And this sheet comes down. And it has all kinds of stuff on it that a good Jewish boy would not eat, let alone touch. And I've always had fun with this. I know there's pickled pig feet in there. Now, I'm not going to touch those things. But they're in there. Barbecue pork ribs. Bacon. Now, I'm going to make you hungry. Now, my sermon is for the next 45 minutes. Okay, so just remember this. No. Sausage. All right? Both the links and the patties. Crawfish. All right? 
all this good stuff. Cracklins. And the, and the voice says, take and eat. Now I'm paraphrasing. And Peter goes, uh-uh, I'm a good Jewish boy. I ain't touching that stuff. It may smell good, but not my lips. And what does that voice say to Peter? What God has created, you don't call ungood. Now I'm paraphrasing again, okay? You look it up in Acts. Get the real wording. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul is pointing out that nothing in God's creation is evil in itself. You remember, you remember in, the, in, in Genesis, in the creation, you go to Genesis and what happens after God creates everything? What does he say? It's good. It's good. It's good. It's very good. Yeah. But because some people didn't understand that and they didn't accept that fact, they stumbled in their faith when they see, saw fellow Christians eating that meat that was offered to pagan idols. And what they would do, the people would go down and buy the meat from butchers that dealt with pagan idols. And they offered some of the meat to the pagan idols and then the other part of the meat, the, if they weren't Christians or Jewish people, which they wouldn't be Jewish people, they would take that meat, some would take it home, and some would take it back to the butcher and sell it on the market. Okay? And you got some Christians there in Rome, and they're going, I don't know if that's right or not. No, it's not, because it's to a pagan idol and all this stuff. So Paul writes Romans chapter 14. Now, let me get over there. You're already there. But in Romans chapter 14, I'm getting there. Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. See? But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of your uh, food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy your food uh, with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let what is for you a good thing to speak of as evil. For the freedom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and proved, approved by man. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of, uh, work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the men who eats and gives offensive. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have has as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he eats his, because his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. Beloved, in that section that we just read through, chapter 14, verses 13 to the end, Paul is saying this, that believers need to temper their freedom with love. And Paul shares this thinking in three ways, and I'm going to share them with you this morning. When your freedom in Christ could hurt a fellow Christian, we should yield. Now, we're going to be back to Galatians chapter 5. Okay? Okay? Verse 15 
says, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Helping brothers and sisters in Christ is far more important, I think you will believe, agree, than exercising our freedom to its fullest, is it not? Yes, Jesus has set us free. But we use our freedom to serve others and not destroy others. So whenever we think our action may cause a Christian to stumble in their faith and their walk with the Lord, we should restrain ourselves. I know the first time after I became a Christian and I went out with some guys and we went to a restaurant and somebody from the church that I went to saw me walk into that restaurant and I didn't even think of it. The restaurant served alcohol. Nowadays, you can't walk into Harley McDonald's without finding a drink. Okay, I know for a fact you can go to the theater and buy whiskey or wine or mixed drinks. That's in theaters. But I didn't even think about it. That Wednesday night, I go to church and I'm confronted by, I think it was one of the deacons. He said, what were you doing in that Bar. Bar? I didn't go in no bar. Well, someone saw you walk in. I go, the restaurant? Yeah. Do you know they serve beer there? No, not really. I didn't know that, you know. But I mean, they were frustrated with me. Well, you could have caused another brother to stumble in Christ. That taught me a lesson. I said, from then on, I'm going to find out. And if, if they do serve alcohol there I may not walk in there now like I said you can't even hardly go to McDonald's today without getting a beer okay but if we know that what we're doing will cause a brother or sister in Christ to stumble we need to just back off it's not going to kill you number two when our freedom could hinder God's work we should yield that's in verse 16 and 17 Godly living and Christian unity are the sum and thrust of the spirit, God's spiritual kingdom, is it not? We should be living a godly life and we should have Christian unity as much as possible. And when we use our freedom in a way that hampers holiness and harmony, we hinder the development of God's kingdom and, beloved, we need to back off. Okay? We just need to back off. Number three, when our freedom creates... Now, this one is personal. Not just to me, but to you too. When our freedom creates unrest in our own conscience, we should yield. Okay? You were in Romans 14. And I've already turned back to Galatians, so I've got to turn back. But in Romans 14, look down at verse 22 and 23 again. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he ap approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Here's the thing, beloved. When you feel uneasy about the situation, morality of a certain practice, if you've got that uneasiness in your heart and in your head, well, just to put it clearly, don't do it. Just don't do it. Because here's why I say don't do it. Because that internal unrest is probably the Holy Spirit of God telling you that that action is wrong. Okay? Now, you may know it from Scripture that it's wrong, but if it's some gray, you know, I, I, I don't like to use that gray area, but if it's some going someplace and you just don't feel comfortable going there because of whatever, don't go. 
don't go. And nobody can look down upon you. Amen? Now, we're going to close this section of Galatians 5 with some real simple thinking because I like simple things. The simpler, the better. Okay? You ready for them? If you are a freedom abuser, you abuse your freedom in Christianity, you need to just slam on the brakes and turn your life back to obeying God's Word. If you are a freedom loser, you too need to apply the brakes and get away from those people who have led you astray. I've had to do that. I've had some friends of mine that I knew if I kept hanging with them, I was going to go off the deep ends. And I was going to totally rebel against God. And some of you know the story that I'm thinking about. And it hurt my heart. Because I love this individual. I cared about him deeply. But I knew what he wanted me to do, and I couldn't do it because I knew it was from against the Word of God. And I will just tell you, I lost his free friendship. But down deep, I've learned that I would rather lose his friendship than my walk with God. Because God is more important. The final thing. If you're a freedom protector, okay, keep moving forward. Don't apply the brakes. Keep pressing forward. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this morning. This morning for our time of worshiping You. Our time this morning of fellowshipping together as brothers and sisters in Christ around the true biblical koinonia, around the person of Jesus Christ. Thank You for bringing us together this morning, Father God, really around Your Word. And Father, I would just pray that You would speak to our hearts and help us to walk close with You as our Savior. And to be aware of what's going on around us, Father God. And if our wording or our action or whatever is, is causing someone to stumble, please give us unrest inside our souls and help us just to back off. Even though we may have the freedom to do whatever, if it hurts that brother or sister, help us not to do it. So Father, help us to walk closer with You as our Savior. But Father, also through Your Holy Scriptures in Galatians chapter 5, draw people to Jesus for salvation. Because that's what's important, Father. Draw them to You. Father God, I pray that you would just lay it on their heart to cry out to you right here, right now. And to cry to you to forgive them of their sins. To forgive them of their sins. And to come into their life through your Holy Spirit and control them. Lead them to you, Father. In Jesus' holy name, amen.